may I kindly request the male professors to take off their caps. May the spirit of wisdom and mercy grow and blossom in all of us. Please be seated. I welcome you all, and in particular, Mr. Gertjan van Stam, to this academic session on the occasion of the public defense of the dissertation, Reflections, a Narrative on Dis Displacement of Technology and Meaning in an African Place. Uh, we have quite some guests from outside, Professor Moutala of the University of Manchester, uh, Professor Koch of Carnegie Mellon University, Dr. Uh, Nakasipwe from Mbara University, um, Professor Dr. Nouwen from the Erasmus University in the Netherlands, uh, Professor Abraham yeah, from uh, McKellar University in Ethiopia, and Professor um, Bissiande, no, oh, the second row there, um, they will be in discussion. The promoters are Professor Reis and Professor Mavere from Great Zimbabwe University and Professor Van Oortmersen and also present Professor Heinders of our own university. Uh, all very welcome for participating on this event. Uh, I give the floor first to Professor Mavere to ask the opening question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jetian, uh, can you uh, briefly uh, share with the audience uh, your work. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, I thank uh, the Rector of Magnificent, uh, Professor Arts, for the opportunity to present my research and findings at this public venue at Tilburg University today. I recognize the presence of esteemed academics just introduced and practitioners of life from all over the world, both present here in Tilburg in person and linked live through the internet or accessing this through recordings. I especially salute those that view this stream from Asfingo and Murambind in Zimbabwe and Macha in Zambia. I thank you all for your efforts to interact with this research and findings on questions on what happens where African society and technologies meet. My thesis introduces many aspects that play a role when investigating the effects um, of the introduction of technology in an African place. I focus on the introduction of information and technology, com uh, information and communication technologies in Macha Zambia and augment my observations with experiences in other locations in Zambia and in Masvingo province in Zimbabwe. Most insights presented comes from living research, systematically studying people and systems while I live and work with my family and friends immersed in an African community. My thesis presents a narrative, a story, of how I performed the research, what I noticed, and present collaboratively developed writings, deduced ideas, and new theories. I am honored that we stand as a team in front of you. Although today protocols position me as the prime actor to defend this work, we are standing here together. My paranymphs, among many others, have purposely undertaken the long journey from their communities in Africa and other places and to stand together with me today. They have sacrificed resources and efforts and the communal grace of communities and the permission of governments empower us to be here together. Their presence is, I propose, um, a rational, uh, sorry, my pr their presence, I propose, is an important part of the evidence that is being presented here today. In the first part of my thesis, I show the rationale of the authority and self-determination of African communities. Therefore, before discussing anything specific on my research, I want to assure that we are together, that we act within the crystallization of African philosophy as in Ubuntu Unhu. Thus, I want to test the explicit, uh, the oral permission to interact from an African place. Only after such an approval, as I wrote in the thesis, I feel properly authorized to make clear what is commonly known in many African rural settings. 
Therefore, I now call upon the engagement of my paranymphs, His Excellency, Senator Chiefs of Chiefs, uh, Charumbira from Zimbabwe, who is wearing his uh, uh, chief gown, and, uh, and we are his subjects, we live in his uh, chiefdom, and Machu Works Director Fred Mwetwa, he is here on behalf of His Royal Highness Chief Chikanta, former Vice Chairman of the House of Chiefs of Chiefs in Zambia, who was denied visa to be traveling to the Netherlands today. Therefore, Your Excellency, Chief of Chiefs, Charumbira, I highly respect your authority. It's an honor, and I thank you and the communities you represent to be here with me today. Do you permit me to speak and disclose what I have learned from your communities from the position of an African community and disseminate the knowledge gleaned from the, uh, from the community in this academic place? Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Royal Highness Chief Chikanta of Zambia, and on my behalf, Chief Chalambira from Zimbabwe, I grant you the permission to share and disclose all the findings that you came across during your research. Thank you very much. And Director Fred Mueta, the same question to you, sir. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, His Royal Highness Chief Chikanta, and indeed the community of Macha, I grant you permission to disclose uh, the findings that you have um, found during your research. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear um, Rector Magnificus, dear members of the committee and dear audience. The past few minutes are an embodied performance of what I wrote about in part one of this letter to the leadership of Macha Works. In part one, I present how I and other foreign to the local African communities are handicapped by, uh, uh, are handicapped to appreciate African inputs by an affliction call, uh, like color vision blindness, uh, deficiency. Color blindness is a condition apparently the case in 8% of men in Northern Ap uh, European ancestry, and I'm one among them. There is a development of glasses that allow certain people to see colors again in a purposefully developed and uh, um, glasses that keep in mind the physiology of the eyes for color blind people, then they are able to see the colors. Likewise, in my work, I try to provide an academic lens that might help to appreciate the cultural colors, keeping the philosophy of African worldviews in mind. Usually, technology is developed and introduced from Western definitions of the world we live in without taking into account African views of the world. And in part one, I describe aspects that hamper acquiring such a view. Among other subjects, I touch upon academic framings, orality, theories of knowledge, and the terrible three, which are Orientalism, Imperialism, and Colonialism. In part two, I present engineering and technology in an African place. Africa shines a bright light that prioritizes community. This light is often misunderstood as it seems overshadowed by colonial meddling. This is especially true when African communities interact with technology involving foreigners. I've had the privilege to bask in such an African light since 1987. Since the year 2000, I have lived in Marambinda, uh, Zimbabwe, and then in Macha, rural Zambia, since 2003, and since 2012, again in Zimbabwe. In part two, I describe a few tokens of what transpires in the lived world. I've published many documents as community deposits before, but this letter contains just pegs, pictures taken with an academic camera for us to talk about today. I paint community life, the use of technology, and highlight some of the discussions as icons in a world that lies behind. Also, I show how, via technology, the historical structures and colonial relationships continue to be confirmed. Unfortunately, in this way, imperialist and orientalist images keep defining African worlds. However, when assessing technology in Africa, I sympathize with Isaac Newton, one of my ancestors in engineering. In 1672, the Royal Society in England published his letter and containing the new theory about light and colors. In this letter, Isaac Newton narrates his amazement when he assesses the constitution of white light. 
The letter describes his wonder and amazement and deep reverence to God as the originator of beauty and being. In part three of this thesis, I provide an overview of my contributions to the body of knowledge. I describe a lens with which to actualize what technology could mean in an African place. This lens, I hope, can act like a prism that Isaac Newton fed to fed white light and see those beautiful eye, uh, 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 colors. The conceptual framework that describes a meaning making in an Africa cultural heritage I labeled the Big Five. They provide critical to derive a contextual understanding of African stories and te of technology and society, locally in an African place with foreigners beyond Africa. The Big Five, the big five is a way to look at a range of different colors uh, as components of the bright light in an African place. They are first Ubuntu, which, we, uh, which I understand as communal love, secondly Oratio, positions at communicating embodied knowledge, Relatio, involving relational resource allocation, Dominio, which strives for maturity, and Animatio, which describes the continuous present moment. My work shows that introductions of technology can be unhelpful in the, unhelpful in the local African community if there is no connection with African meaning making. Technology introduced without respect for African values and meaning making becomes part of a supercolonial relationship between the West and Africa. I, I conclude, my work calls on the honoring of African values that frame social significance in Africa. Such an honoring, I hope, can provide for new means of an academic sensitivity and toolboxes with methods to test interventions and technology to counter ongoing, ongoing colonial domination and inequality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introduction. We still move on with a dis critical discussion by West on academic values, if you excuse us. Uh, the first uh, one will be Professor Motala of Manchester University. I thank you very much, Gestion, for that um, certainly very inspiring uh, piece of work. Like all academic pieces of work, they raise questions, um, perhaps sometimes even more than the answer. My first question to you is to relate to one of your contributions, which is in the space of Oresio. And in this context, you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you assert that orality, which is the oral culture, of uh, rural communities and perhaps some African communities has an important place to play. This is in tension with the received wisdom that we must all become literate, in the sense that we must be able to write down our thoughts, our history, and so on. And uh, this is an issue that I would like you to address. How do you see orality as a culture in the context of the clear uh, imperative to be literate, to teach our people to read and write. Thank you. Thank you, esteemed opponent, uh, dear uh, Professor Metale. I'm very grateful for your question, and I could have anticipated this one, <laughs> as we have had a wonderful conversation in the aeroplane from Lusaka to, uh, to England uh, at the time, and we had uh, this discussion for six hours, and I've learned a lot from you, and I thank you for this wonderful question. And I think this question will remain also to be discussed. In my view, uh, orality is not just a cultural threat, it is a way of um, uh, communicating. It's actually what in the later part of my thesis I explain um, to be embodied, uh, it is a vehicle for embodied knowledge. Oratio plays a very important role, orality actually, in embodied knowledge. Actually, I, I, I agree with you, literacy is very important for uh, registration uh, of uh, the knowledge, as you have mentioned. However, I see literature, uh, literacy actually as a part of, oratio, of orality. Orality is the total way of communicating, among which is literacy, in my view. Um, Actually, it's very interesting, uh, Walter Ong, who uh, has uh, done the seminal work on orality, or, and whose work I refer to uh, widely, is, uh, has indicated there will be a second orality. He actually uh, was, wrote those in the 80s, and it was not the time that we all have our videos and uh, phones. 
I think our, when I look at our children and when I uh, talk with the children or, uh, also here in the Netherlands, I see they are using their mobile phone to do video. And that is exactly what Ong explains as second orality. That's how they now transmit. They have not been typing too much text, but they have, have the literacy of the mobile phone. So I see orality as wider and not in conflict with textuality. That would be my answer, sir. Yes, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm very relieved to hear that answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then the discussion will be continued by Professor uh, Awa of Michele University in Ethiopia. Thank you. Uh, I really have enjoyed reading your thesis, and uh, I do have a question on it. Uh, your thesis has clearly shown on how the uh, African indigenous contexts are incongruent with the realities that exist in the Western uh, parts. And the core issue of the idea, as I have observed, is the African philosophy, Ubuntu, uh, which is based on thinking that I am because uh, we are. And this is a fundamental issue for clear understanding with each other that exists in Africa. Uh, such issues usually deal with the maturity of dealing with uh, multiple memories of the past and the uncertainties of the future. Such a maturity also entails our attitude towards ourselves and others. This is all about forgiveness, love, uh, hope, and uh, self-esteem, which are very basic. and. Uh, my question here is, on the other side, our planet is facing so many problems, uh, which I think is total sum of uh, the crisis which are occurring in regard to this idea of, uh, so how do you elaborate or how can you explain the role that this Ubuntu can uh, help or can contribute in saving our planet, or in short, what do you think and how can the rest of the world, especially the West, learn from such an African philosophy in solving its problems? In short, I'm asking the relevance of Ubuntu uh, in outside of Africa. How do you analyze it? And that's my question. Thank you. Dear esteemed opponent and dear professor, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful, absolute wonderful question. And um, also thank you for coming all the way from Ethiopia. And uh, I'm aware that um, the question of love and uh, African culture is close to your heart. And um, you have done magnificent work in that area. So thank you very much for this uh, excellent question. And actually I feel completely unqualified to answer it. Um, however, I have been authorized uh, just now to answer it uh, because uh, my paraphernalia are much better equipped to do that, but that's my role right now. And as the uh, Rector of Magnificent uh, observed, we are here in, the, in a Western setting. And that we discuss this in this forum right now with uh, our team standing here is proof that there is interest in Ubuntu. Um, which is already in itself an embodied um, uh, hope-giving event that we are experiencing right now. Um, to come more into the specifics of your question, um, is there hope, uh, is there something that we can learn? I think the, the thesis gives a number of frameworks that can, be, that can lead in uh, to such a discussion. Um, the, the, the framework of paradigm switching uh, which actually helps to explain how come that sometimes it cannot be recognized. Um, in an environment uh, that currently is, uh, you know, there are big questions in the West about what's next, global warming, all these aspects. And uh, the inputs of Ubuntu are crucial to understand how to, in my view, how to uh, deal with those questions. And uh, several um, tools sort of are given in the thesis. But, uh, undeniable, and I'm proudly that we stand and you have all come together, I think we have done that because of Ubuntu. It is a cry to say this is important. And how come that Ubuntu is so strong is because of the supercolonial times we live in, 
those who are having difficult times have character. They know what they know. And that is, uh, we can summarize that in Ubuntu. So I have great hope that as soon as the world really is going to search, and when we have concluded here today, and when we continue co working collaboratively, and these kind of forests allow us to speak, that's when it's being heard. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then the discussion will be continued by Professor Koch of Car Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, honoring me by allowing me to be part of this committee, inviting me to read this magnificent document. Um, but as with all academic work, it <laughs> opens up lots of questions. In particular, I, I would like to have you extrapolate you're very, very careful, and to your credit, you're very careful in your dissertation to make it clear that you're writing from your very particular experience and the very particular situation that you're in. Um, but I think it would be interesting to hear you extrapolate in two ways. One is, to what extent do you believe your findings, and especially your identif identification of what you call the big five, uh, to what extent are those uh, values, specifically African, or what aspects of those values are basically found in any indigenous rural culture. And the other part of it is, as you look at urbanization, so you talk specifically about rural Africa, do you see urbanization and urban Africa in particular continuing to carry these values? Or, well, just tell me what you think about urbanization. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> to your esteemed opponent, uh, Dr. Kroch, again, um, it's very significant to receive this question from you because of your experience as also an expatriate living in Rwanda, flying from Rwanda, and sp uh, playing such an important role in the Rwandan development which is uh, sometimes described as the pearl of Africa in the sense also for ICT, so we look for your guidance also. And I thank you uh, for coming here today. Um, these are absolutely wonderful uh, questions. Um, the big five, um, uh, yes. Uh, actually, it's a question of methodology first. And I, the methodology of um, the extended case study and how uh, Michael Boroway put it actually uh, explains that you can come from a small observation and drive big pictures. That's what I dare to do, but I hardly dare to say it because <laughs> um, that is even more constrained in an environment like this. But there is big opportunities indeed to expand on the big five within the methodology of the, of the thesis and expand it further. Because indeed, I agree with you, I think these, these values are present in almost every human being. African people are not different than anybody else. We're all the same in the eyes of God, first of all, but secondly, we are all human. And thus, I recognize the, the big five everywhere. However, in an environment like in the rural areas where resources are very constrained, they, expo they, they really come to the fore because this is really coping mechanisms also and how to keep the community alive. They are really building community. It's community first, but how to build community. Big five play a role. Everybody wants community, I've seen. When I come here, there's questions, and then there's question, how do we build community? And they said, well, read this big five. Actually, they are helpful. I think there are several links that the big five can link into. There are theologies, there are uh, sociologies, there are many uh, areas that they might synthesize uh, stu uh, students and researchers to, uh, to, to probe further. So I agree with your um, um, intuition that this is bigger than it could be. But here we are, de I'm defending here. Here I can prove that they exist in this environment, as you also have heard, and that proof is there. But I, I call upon other researchers to work together and recognize them all, because then I want to link to the previous question. I think they are important for the world. The second question uh, you uh, asked <laughs> on urbanization. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, of course, again, I'm not fully, um, um, you know, capable of answering the question because although we also, uh, I work with SEDIC, as I already see in Zimbabwe, which is an ur based in urban areas, so we also have, a, you know, a pied-à-terre in, in urban areas, it's uh, sincerely confusing. 
I think it's kind of, if when we use uh, use the lenses of super colonialism, and we look at the cities, we discover very many things. What I've discovered uh, in other travels in South Africa and so on, that uh, the colonial times and the ongoing colonial times are really pushing the cities to be something that they want it to be. And it's not necessarily what, whatever that means Africans want it to be. It's just there because of the capitalistic systems, of markets, principles, and so on. I'm, I meet lots of friends who live in cities who I've seen are struggling to bring these things to the fore. But I have recognized a, and desire to bring them to the fore. We call that in Zimbabwe, Kamusha. We want the Kamusha going to where one comes from, which is most of the time not in town, is really influencing life. So I would like to, to, to say that urbanization is a big question, a very important question because of the growing urbanization. But again, the lenses that I hope this thesis provide can give some new perspectives in looking into urbanization and start to recognize the, the, the local value systems that hopefully can counter some of the very um, difficult situations that people are in in cities. So I call upon using this and almost re-establish community again also in cities and I hope uh, that we can do that together. Let me follow up. Uh, I mean, obviously, you've lived, you've lived in urban Africa as well as rural Africa. Do you, do you see and feel that these values are being retained in some ways, that there's a distinctly African dimension to, the, the urban, to urban Africa? Yes. Or do you see the urbanization militating against them? That's, that's the no, I see it, yes. I recognize in the urban area. I will give you an anecdote. This is not in the thesis, but uh, when uh, we were working with our technology partners in South Africa, who was showing a, a, a big place, 70 kilometers away from Pretoria, and I asked the, uh, the, the ones who drove me around, in this big town, can I see the chief, please? They were looking at me in wonderment. At the end of the day, we met the chief. So he was there, but he was, you know, it was difficult to, to bring it out. So that's why I say, Profoundly, yes, I've experienced it in, 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 in uh, my research. Um, there's much more to report than in this uh, book is. Uh, but uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, uh, and I'm convinced it's very important to study it because it is a very major issue. But yes, my answer is yes. So I'm, I'm going to just end with a comment. Yes. Uh, as an American, uh, I didn't realize how we are uh, so extreme in, as individuals, uh, individualism, uh, until I lived in Europe for a period of time, and now certainly in Africa. And although um, you're claiming and, and, and saying that these values permeate uh, all of humanity, uh, they certainly don't permeate all cultures equally. Mm -hmm. And I have to confess, uh, reading some aspects of your uh, work made me yearn for uh, wishing that my culture had a little bit more of some of these values. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the discussion will be continued by Dr. Nouwen of the Erasmus University in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam. Thank you very much, uh, dear candidates. Um, to start with, I would like to congratulate you with your, with your thesis, and I would like to congratulate your promotors, as well as your family and your friends who are all here. Um, so that's to, to start off and to compliment you with this book and your standing here uh, to defend your, your thesis. Um, now, like you, I'm tall, I'm white, um, I'm trained in the West, and reading your, your thesis, I get confused. And, and, and perhaps even more confused because I'm a medical doctor, and a medical doctor is really practical and not so much about philosophies. Uh, you just want to do, you want to act. And if I read on page 350, uh, at the end of your thesis, that foreign academic research and technology for development uh, are embedded in power-based institutes situated in the West and are insensitive and most unsuitable for use in African practice and cultures, I get even more confused. Yes. So then I ask myself, why am I in this committee? Um, that's one. But the other thing is, if and that relates to, to the... To the, to the question you just posed before, um, I have really two questions for you. One is, if I read your thesis and if I look at the big five, then 
and I heard you yesterday teaching my students in Rotterdam, and I hear about communal love, then can I translate communal love to solidarity? And can I, if so, translate that to what people now in the West, although life is better in the West than ever before, um, if you look at life expectancy, if you look at healthy life expectancy, if you look on every marker that's there, um, perhaps not loneliness, but that's something you touched upon yesterday as well. Um, is that not something which we had in the West in the 50s and the 60s? And then I come back also because you, you have this statement about the center and the center of the center and the periphery of the center and the periphery of the periphery. Is it not that perhaps Western culture has lost some of these things going from perhaps a we or an it paradigm to an I paradigm, which perhaps in the US people has, have lo lost as well, or society has lost as well, uh, and that that perhaps translates to people wanting to go back to the 50s and the 60s because that was easy, that was uh, small villages, not big cities, a small world, not a big world. Um, so how would you react upon that? Thank you, uh, this esteemed opponent. I thought you wanted to ask two questions, but this seemed to be one. I keep the next one for after this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, addressing uh, our lo long white uh, complexion. Maybe that's also why you're in the committee. I don't know why you're in the committee. But um, I think what uh, we share, uh, dear opponent, is a desire to learn from others and to respect where we go. I know you as a traveler all over the world. Where you go, you uh, embrace the local environment and you're really keen to work accordingly. Um, so maybe I should have made a special note in that sentence, except uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Nauen, I'm not sure. But uh, it is, uh, it, in general, yes, um, I make a strong point, an audacious point in the thesis that um, we must value local culture that is not necessarily known, and this other culture that comes in with research and stuff just comes in without sensitivity to it, and then it's not helpful. Um, actually, it delays, I would uh, I have put in other place, uh, you know, it just takes away the attention, the local attention to solve the local problems. Um, is Ubuntu something that was had? I think uh, paradigm switching is a unique proposal in this, in this thesis. Um, Kuhn talks about paradigm shifting, but basically he talks about one paradigm. I, I want to rubbish that notion with this thesis because I don't think it's there. There are multiple paradigms, I just do one. And actually literature also, which I referred, is asking about meta paradigms and so on and so on. So I think all of these paradigms have, are shifting. So the we are also shifting and the I is also shifting. Let's hope it shifts to each other. I'm not sure about that because you're, you almost gave the answer to your own question. Um, so whether or not it is here, it's, an, I don't know. I didn't do research here in the Netherlands. I did research in uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe and, and other African places. And I, of course, got sensitized by what I learned here. So I can't answer that question. What is happening in the Netherlands is not in my study. Um, but um, I would hope that um, paradigm switching, supercoloniality, and the big five will give a new cadre to address issues. And actually, I was very encouraged by the lesson that we did yesterday with, uh, with your students, over 100 students, and the question that came afterwards was a new sensitivity. There was a question, actually, how do I tell in the Netherlands to my brother who's 17 about this, this profound experience I had? Then I said, well, I'm also, you are a doctor, I'm an engineer. To learn engineering, uh, you have to learn Laplace transformation. That's a mathematical method that you don't know when you haven't studied it. So I would call upon the students to study it. You know, they spend their time to learn to it, but I, you, you cannot just say it in one word to your 17 years old uh, brother. So we need to study together, and I would hope that this work from Africa will help informing the work that happens in this environment, because we all need help from each other. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then I come to my second question, and that is, if time permits. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's about 
healthcare. I said I'm a medical doctor. So, and if you look at healthcare in the West, um, and what it just related to is that life in the West, if you look at various parameters, is better than it used to ever be. Um, even if you ask people in the West if they are happy or not, then they are happier than a long time ago. So how do we then translate things we've developed in the West to an African setting? So how do we translate with your knowledge, um, knowledge from a Western Institute, from a super colonial power, super colonialism, right. to a setting in Africa where both parties can benefit, but also whereby, because if, if a child dies here, I guess a mother is, and a father, and the relatives and the family are um, sick of such, such a thing happening. I think that the same is true for a woman in Africa losing a child. Uh, that he or she will be as tormented by the death of a child as people would be here. Um, but perhaps that's my uh, prejudice. Uh, so I, my, my question would be, why, how would we be able to, learning from, from your experiences, um, connect the two worlds and improve healthcare in, in Africa, especially in rural Africa? Thank you, esteemed opponent. Now you're coming very close to home because my wife is also a medical doctor. And uh, we live there and we try it. So what are we trying? <laughs> And some of your, um, um, from the engineering perspective, of course, doc doctoring and engineering, you know, it's a different subject, but it's, uh, there's some analogy in the methodologies. Um, it's a bit the same. In my, my, my thesis, I really um, stand against ICT for development to a certain extent. Uh, you know, this whole this for development thing is, is, yeah, it's fantastic here, so it should also go there. Um, that's an assumption I don't agree with you on. Um, I fully agree with you when people stay alive, they shouldn't die. So I'm with doctors, keep people alive, there's no discussion there. But all the other uh, measurements of success of the medical profession or the technology profession or whatever, those, those measurements, I question them from the perspective of who set them, who set those rules for measuring success. Um, and in engineering, I found that most of those measurements are being set in conference room in this part of the world and not in the southern part of the world. So I question, I'm not giving answers, I question whether or not the assessment of success have been defined by the community who is supposed to reach that success. So in that way, I can't join in your thinking because what you consider success in a Dutch environment or in a, in a Western environment, I'm not sure if that would be considered success in an African environment. I don't know. I didn't study it, but I can question it here. So therefore, um, on the engineering side, I tell people first, well, you know, if you read this and you agree with it and it, it teaches something, go and listen, you know, what it is. And I know you do, so I'm not, it's, uh, but in general, I think in the professions, the WHO, which is certainly uh, based in Geneva, has a lot of rules, as far as I know, and I'm not so sure how Africa is contributing to it. I don't know. I didn't study it. But in engineering, I've seen in the 5G environment, for instance, one of my chapters, that Africa is not consulted. So then I question 5G and its legitimacy, and of course, it's here positioned in this environment as very successful in the next big, big thing, but I can completely question it, because where is the African input? And I prove it is none. So we question the reason for success. So although I evaded your question a little bit on the medical doctor because I didn't study it, I hope to have contributed something to the discussion that I hope in further research can contribute to a better well-being for all human beings in the world. Okay. Discussion will be continued by Dr. Nakazife from Mbara University. Dear candidate, Congratulations for making it up to this level. Um, I'm also honored to be part of this panel to seek more clarity from the African perspective. Um, misconception about Africa, a common place in the West, more especially in the literature and the media, 
And in 2001, President George W. Bush famously committed, and I will quote him, Africa is a nation that suffers from terrible disease, thereby reducing, and I end the quotation, thereby reducing the planet's second largest continent to a single country. Errors and generalizations like these are widespread and perpetuated by both the media and by the popular culture. With so many misconceptions about Africa in existence, it's often hard to get a realistic view of a continent that is as <coughs> complex as its beauty. On page 167 of your thesis, I read a similar statement, and I quote you. Rural Africa is often in survival mode, surviving the HIV pandemic, staying alive in situations with rife and malaria, TB and other diseases. In such of, in such of and often having no fight for education, water, transport, communication, energy, and financial services. I end your quote. Does this statement not equally portray Africa as poor in denial of its vast diversity? Are your observations from Macha not also in danger of constructing an overgeneralization that reduces Africa to a small community, Masha, with the homogeneous problems without recognizing the diversity on the continent? Can you comment on the danger that your generalization across African regions uh, places Africa to a simplified notion? That's my first question. All right. Thank you very much, uh, esteemed opponent. And thank you very much. I was also honored to be at your uh, defense. And uh, your work on uh, the women in northern Uganda is, uh, is very uh, profound and informative. And I agree with you um, on the generalizing statements of Africa in, uh, in public media. And I think I put it in the thesis as part of uh, media imperialism. So it's, it serves an imp imperialistic uh, notion of uh, uh, that part of the terrible three. So the whole generalization is orientalism, it it's, uh, it's shows in imperialism and it uh, results in colonialism, indeed. So the, the quote that you have, I, mean, I have to see it in context, but indeed sounds like that. Um, but it's specifically on, in the context, and I'm, I must almost look now which context it was, um, it, it should be qualified, that context, and I hope it is, um, because the methodology uh, allows uh, to look at the environment of matcha. So I come to your uh, generalization issue before addressing that one, um, to look at the matcha environment and come to generic conclusions, of course qualified. And I think the big five and uh, the, the, the proposals of the paradigm switching and the big five are are general statements like that, that could be seen as um, reinfying, you know, it makes it happen. Um, that's why we have here uh, the, the testimony that I can represent those uh, stories as representing from those areas. I have uh, explained in my dissertation where I've been and not been. So, um, and then that statement that in the rural areas of survival mode, actually we also live in the rural areas, very often in survival mode ourselves. Um, so this is a statement in the context, I hope it's qualified around the context, um, that we have uh, seen a lot, yes, so I would state, uh, stand with the statement in that environment that we have been visiting, yes. And then my second question. Um, I know that you consider uh, this problem of generalization. You, you, you also have put into context the notion of agentic resilience by the Africans, Africans being able to live within their circumstances and managing to, to an average. You set out in your book the traditional culture through the big five. 
This raises the important question of how such virtues of traditional culture can be regarded and be of use to the community and its people in the rapidly changing world. May I, I ask you then, from your lived experience in Macha and the, in Africa, what is the relevance in your view of keeping a traditional African culture in the era of the globalized technology? Okay, thank you very much, um, the esteemed opponent. And actually, I was very glad with uh, the introduction of the second question that we seem to uh, have uh, come together in the discussion of the first question. Um, I'm not here to judge, so I have no opinion about uh, these findings in the settings, uh, whether or not they should be, um, uh, what should happen with them. I first of all thought it was important that we discuss here today, and I defend that they are, they exist as the way I've, I've, I've put them here. I stand for that. Of course, you can ask me, what is, what, how do you view that? I think, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. In the areas I've been, um, I've recognized very often that there is a sort of double um, negation of self, uh, basically explained in the thesis as um, become what the others say you are. Um, I would hope that the contributions of this thesis and this research and the ongoing research, because this is just the start, as I've quoted, as, as stated, is um, also sensitize everybody, also in Africa. We do this mainly for Africa, we do it, discuss it here, but this is very important that it's also in Africa we discuss this as, you, as we are doing here in this forum, uh, what the values are. Do we recognize them ourselves in our communities when ours is Afri in Africa? And I don't think everybody does. But I would state from the research and the proof that is shown and the, 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 rev the revertures made out of that, that I stand for this result. And I would hope and look forward to this engage with universities all around the world, but especially in Africa and in our community, like uh, Macha, Great Zimbabwe University, and, and UNSA and others, to discuss this question you have just posed. Because I think it's not up to me to answer it, but it's up to our next generation, our students, of texts like this and other texts to come to their own uh, well-balanced view on the question that you've just asked. Then the discussion will be continued by Dr. Bissiande of the University of Luxembourg. So, I, I was told that the praising should come later, but let me just say that uh, thank you very much for documenting in textuality all the values that have been vehicled in orality. So, what's interesting is that while I was reading this, I kept nodding at every page until my neck was a bit, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but then in the end, I have a couple of questions that were raised, which, are, which start with the question, uh, Gertian, what do we do now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the uh, esteemed <laughs> uh, opponent, um, I, I, I want to return praise. Thank you for this question. And thank you for your hard work. Um, especially, although you're introduced uh, from the University of Luxembourg, I see in you the um, Université Ouagadougou, and the hope uh, of the students that we met in Ouagadougou discussing this exact thing. Because this, this is us, you also, members of the committee, uh, member of the public, the chief, the director, uh, this is your work. I'm just privileged to present it here. So you nodding, I hope you recognize your own <laughs> contributions and the, the contribution from your students and from the communities. Um, I have other people that also, uh, you know, will be sort of doing this, but sort of what, what, what next? The same question. If this is true, what does that mean? And maybe a little bit like Dr. Nauen's questions, you know, how do we do this? And that is, I, we are here in an academic institution. Our hope is in the students that walk around. I'm a student, and maybe that sort of finishes now. Um, and then it's time to teach and to humbly propose these kind of proposals to our new generation, who will be the new leaders, who will be implementing the what next. So my what next uh, suggestion is let's work together and, 
and I know you're doing it and all the professors with you, is um, let's teach the ne next generation to be sensitive to the community, to be sensitive to their own cultural heritage. And I would, in, in, in Zimbabwe, at the Great Zimbabwe University, there's a wonderful new development, which I also reported in the thesis, which is a school for cultural, uh, for cultural heritage and international diplomacy, where there will be first being studied what does it mean to be me in this area, the self from that area, African philosophy, this is my fingers, African philosophy, Zimbabwean, and so on and so on. Then the international ones, because we need to know them all. And then how do, you, how do we negotiate in our global community the same question that was asked there? So my what next is, my hope is in the new generation. But I also say it's our responsibility, and depending on your verdict today, uh, I will also take up that responsibility, because this is just the start. What next is that we as a committee, as audience, as everybody that listens to this uh, um, uh, defense, is to take up each of our responsibilities to make a better world. And in Africa, I've learned that there is wonderful African values, qualities, whatever we call it, because even that, I want to question what we call it. Let's come from our cultural heritage, our roots in African philosophy, discuss it. It's not long that that is possible. In settler colonialism, it was not allowed. So it's, it's relatively young, but it's in thousands of years history. Let's bring it to the front. Let's put lenses on, maybe some I've proposed. Others will propose others, it's good, but let's discuss it. Because right now, it doesn't happen. Um, I salute Tilburg University, my promoters, to allow this to happen today. I salute my, uh, my paranymphans to be here, standing with me today, because I don't think that happens often, that somebody stands up and stands, there's an African knowledge that can be uh, opposed, but not given in yet, in discussion. So I think there was a question from Dr. Kroch about love and um, how it should be seen. I think uh, love, communal love, oh no, sorry, there was uh, um, means that we are uh, together, we are complementary. So Africa is complementary to a certain extent to other knowledge systems, but the complementarity is not well known. So what's next is to um, discuss these issues of what does it mean to be who we are in the Netherlands here, in Zimbabwe there, in, Bu in Burkina there, what does it mean? And from our diversity, then build a better world. And that's the students that are out there that are going to do that. And we are there to lead them. That's why we have this uh, setting right now. So okay, that's my answer. Do I still have time for two? Okay. Um, the next question is based on the document. There is a, an entire chapter where you actually go to examples, specifically the case of 5G. You know, and then when I read this, I said, oh, interesting. But, uh, you know, is it, isn't it a bit our fault to not contribute? Because this is a standard where everybody is called upon to say something about it. If there is nothing about Africa in it, it's because we didn't propose in the first place. That's one. And second, what prevents us from having a big five, 5G in Africa? We can do it, right? Yes. Um, yes, a fault finding is a difficult job. Um, okay. Because what somebody sees as good, others see as bad, and so on. I think um, the, the model that I propose in the thesis of supercolonialism gives uh, uh, sheds light on this issue. That's actually why I put the proposal that. Not specifically on 5G, I propose it as an icon, something to s look at and maybe also recognize somewhere else. Of course, Africa's voice are, is not heard in many developments. Uh, you know, HDTV or uh, 5G or I don't know what, uh, in technology in general. Um, we can blame ourselves from an Africa, in, in Africa to not doing that, but also we don't have the resources for that because they have been uh, disappropriated as I have seen, uh, as I have explained in another chapter. So it's a double edging sword. I, the only thing what, what Indeed, we need those proposals. I would hope that what we do today creates space to do so. By having this published, this, at least it can be known that we maybe didn't do it from the African perspective. At the other end, tickets from Africa to places in Houston or you know, even the Netherlands are pretty expensive, while if you fly from Houston to, uh, to the Netherlands, it's uh, one third of the cost sometimes, you know? So we have big barriers to overcome. So uh, then we come into policy uh, proposals. Of course, now it's the politics to, to make available uh, resources to the right courses. 
Our role as academics is to put in good proposals to the, uh, to the government. I'm not sure if we did. Maybe we already thought we couldn't. Well, I know my colleagues at SEDEC, I know the colleagues at uh, SIRDC, I've seen your, your colleagues in uh, Ouagadougou, very capable of giving fantastic contributions. So I call upon us, from an academic point of view, to develop together with our students policy proposed to politics to make uh, available the resources and then indeed forcefully go into 5G using the five, uh, the, the not individualizing but communalizing uh, technologies. And I'm sure that uh, everybody in this world is looking forward to that. Yeah, I give uh, the word again to Professor Mutale for another question or follow up. Um, it probably wouldn't be uh, very different from what was asked earlier. But really, uh, maybe as a comment, uh, we certainly need to move from the stage where we analyze and understand to finding solutions. And particularly your anecdote on 5G. I think if we externalize the problem in the sense that well, we have not been invited to make a contribution or being ignored, isn't that really a problem of the one that's being ignored? I think we need to find a way to empower ourselves to have a voice and to go to the forum and make our point. Because nobody's going to give you anything if you don't, or if they perceive you not to have anything to say. You must stand up and be able to make a contribution positively by yourself. So in other words, if this work can enable the empowerment of the African engineers and scientists to be able to take their rightful place on the world stage and make contributions that affect them, then that would be fantastic. Thank you. The session is adjourned for the deliberation. Please wait for the return of the committee.
Dear candidate, the doctor board. Yeah, I'm too quick. We stand here. Yeah. Dear candidate, the doctor board of Tilburg University has taken note of your dissertation and have heard your defence and appreciated it. The doctor board has decided to confer upon you the doctorate. Professor Miriam van Rijsten is uh, authorised to bestow this dignity upon you. It gives me great pleasure to accept the task assigned to me by the Rector Magnificus of the University. By virtue of the authority granted to us by the law and by the regulations of the University, in accordance with a decision by the Doctorate Board of Tilburg University, I hereby promote you, Gert-Jan van Stam, to doctor. You acquire hereby all the rights that by law or custom are or will be attached to the doctorate. Apart from the rights, a doctorate also comes with obligations. These, first of all, include the execution of research and all scholarly activities with the utmost integrity. The privilege of being a doctor also entails that society needs to be able to rely on the sound and independent judgment of those holding a doctorate. As proof of your promotion to doctor, I hand you the certificate signed by the Rector Magnificus and the supervisors 